Hello, I'm Barry Daniel, and this is the podcast of the Middle Way Society. Our aim is to encourage a universal approach to living a more integrated, ethical life, avoiding dogma or any appeal to authority. Our guest today is Peter Block, who is a consultant and speaker in the areas of organisation development, community building and civic engagement. He's the author of several books, including Another Kingdom, Departing the Consumer Culture, The Community, The Structure of Belonging, and perhaps his most well-known work, The Abundant Community, which he co-wrote with John McKnight, which has now become a full project in itself beyond the book. Uh, The broad themes discussed in these books will be the topic of our discussion today. Hello, Peter. Welcome to the Middle Way Society podcast. Hello. Thank you. Great to be here. Very nice. Well, could you begin, Peter, by telling us maybe a bit about your background and and how you got involved with this field of work? Uh, Most of my career, I cared about systems and how to make organizations, churches, schools, governments, mostly businesses, because that's where the money was. Yeah. More democratic, uh, team building. You know, I was a, so for 30 years, that's what I did. And whoever called, I answered. And uh, and then it's about in the 90s, I started getting calls from uh, more community-based city managers, people concerned about the civic space. So really for the last 20 years, I've kind of done a little both. But right now I'm more concerned about the common good, the civic space, uh, engaging citizens and shifting the narrative. And so that's what I do now. It's a, Okay. Well, let's dive in then, Peter. What, what do you mean by a system or an institutional way of life? And the, I, as you said, you work with it for 30 years, but what are its limitations? Why do you think it's not really fit for purpose? Well, it has a perspective. And, and at once it was the, the church. Another time it was government. Who knows? Now it's the business perspective. And so the culture lives within in the Western world, the business perspective, which says that the things that matter are speed, cost, efficiency, scale, and everything else bows down uh, in the face of those gods. And so any time you want to do anything, you say, how long will it take? Mm. How much does it cost? Can't we do it cheaper? Can't we take it to scale? It's a culture of convenience. And this perspective is fine if you're running a business, but we're not. We're trying to create a, create a life, kind of create well-being in the world. And, uh, and so really the, the system perspective is fine for your system. It's not an argument against order. It's an argument against the gods of speed, scale, cost efficiency, convenience. Apparently, if you look at the word prosperity itself, Peter, associating it almost exclusively with wealth acquisition is a quite a recent thing. Um, yes. I, I heard that, you know, it used to mean something more akin to flourishing, human flourishing. Is this what you're trying to get back to? There is a huge flourishing movement, a well-being movement. The, the Dalai Lama's into it. You know, all the big brands are into it. And it's being demanded of us. It's not just a movement out of sentiment. It's just that the world of traditional economics is breaking down. We, and the, the, I can only really speak for the U.S., but we, the middle class is gone. We don't make anything. We don't produce anything. And one of the things that drives us, if we live within the business perspective, is the measures are all measures of of, uh, gold, of wealth, gross national product, gross domestic product. Now we talk about each other that way. Oh, you're middle class. Oh, you're upper middle class. You're the 1%. I'm the lower class. I'm poor. None of those words describe human beings. They're all just slivers of who we are, but we've taken them to be a totality. And so I don't even, you know, poverty to me, is the underlying issue. It's an economic question of all the violence in the world. You know, they say it's religion. They say it's uh, 
And so to take that on, you have to change your language, even our speaking about. So there, it is a call to shift the narrative about what matters to us. I interviewed someone recently, a guy called Harbin To, who is the program director of the Gross National Happiness Project in Bhutan. Yeah. Um, what do you think of that attempt? Because they want to avoid this tying of uh, well-being with, with GDP. It makes sense. Now, they'll do it in a way that makes sense for Bhutan. But Mark Anielski has written a book called The Economics of Happiness. So he has ways of measuring the well-being of your neighborhood. And, and he measures the social capital. He measures the trust. And uh, for all the things we care about, it's going to take you know, a different kind of measurement. But this is happening everywhere. It just will never get reported on by the media because it's, it's, not, uh, it's not born of violence. You make a, a, a distinction between a citizen and a consumer. Could you just elaborate on that a little bit, please, Peter? Well, a, a consumer is someone who believes that everything can be purchased, that you can outsource everything, including raising your children, being healthy, being safe, caring for the elders, caring for the earth. We think we can write a check and someone else will take care of that. And so that's what it means to be a consumer. To be a citizen is to, is to show up as a co-producer of things that matter. Uh, and, you know, in the business perspective, there's no such thing as satisfaction. Customer satisfaction is an oxymoron because as soon as you buy something, they want you to buy another one. So that's the gospel of a consumption, is it? The gospel of consumption is very simply that whatever you have is not enough. Why do you think the consumer life, though, is so seductive? We've associated with democracy. We've associated with God. Those are two powerful allies. And so we think that this is the, quote, American way, land paved with gold. And because we, for what, a lot of reasons, we've decided that the common good needed to be enclosed. And we began that in England 300 years ago. And now... There's no visible alternative. And I suppose the advertising industry spends trillions of dollars and pounds, and they know exactly how to push our, all our psychological buttons, don't they? Yes, they do, but we produce them. They got produced when, when they discovered in the 1920s that the shoe industry could produce enough shoes for all of Americans in 14 weeks. And they decided, what are we going to do with the other 38 weeks? And they said, oh, I got an idea. How about if every woman in America needs 27 pairs of shoes? <laughs> and it's true. Yeah. That's the average number of shoes. And, and the guys have their own thing. And so we, we're full participants in it. We are willing to be anesthetized. We're willing to watch TV. We're willing to be bombarded with 3,000 advertising images. So you're right, but I, I don't blame the advertising industry. They just, this is what they do. The spider bites the frog crossing the river. No, I, I, I get that, Peter. So, okay. so what, what has happened to culture in the consumer society then? Well, it's, it's been forgotten. If culture means a habitual way of being together, where we join together around things we want to create, like food, like music, like raising of children. It's been co-opted. It's been commercialized. I've been commodified. I think, you know, instead of Descartes, now it's I shop. Therefore, I am. So we've moved from um, homo empathicus almost to homo economicus. Totally. And, and, and you know, and, and economics meant household management. But, and we all, to me, the problem is that's what we talk about. So your job, the reason I like what you're doing, is you're trying to shift the conversation. You're trying to create an alternative narrative, and that's what all of us are doing. And it's happening, but slowly. And don't ask me whether I'm optimistic or not. Okay, I won't. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay um, economics, we've been talking about e economics, in a sense, it's the study of scarce resources. But you yeah. argue that what communities have is abundance. Well, somebody made up the idea that economics was about scarce resources. That's a, that's a social construction. It's not a fact. 
It's not true. It's just it's been useful for us for a long time, you know, with the industrialization. So the alternative is to say that we have enough, that economics is the uh, distribution or embracing of, of the fact there is enough to eat. There is enough around us. I have enough. Uh, and so it's a, it's a shift to an economics of abundance, an economics of enough, an economics of cooperation. See, we had an economics of the commons, a shareable economics. You hear all this language popping up that reconstructs the basic tenet of economics. Olivia Saunders is a professor of economics in the Bahamas, just wrote a book on tomato economics. And she says, even uh, in our religion, it's the God of abundance. And uh, in the wilderness, the Exodus story. So the Jews left Egypt into the wilderness. The wilderness is nothing there. That's what a non-consumer life looks to us now. There's nothing there. And they got there and found out there was plenty there. But isn't there also in the, in, certainly in the Bible, this idea that we are the dominion of all nature and you can just go out there and take what you want. Has that played a part too, that message? It's huge. It's all part of it. It's all, it's all part of the imperial, the empire. This is the modern version of Pharaoh's empire is that the land is ours to privatize. Yeah. These, these guys just in, in, the, in the West here wanted to take back public lands. This is mine. Mm-hmm. It's mine. So our work, the middle way in my mind, is a reclaiming of the common good, of the commons, the commonwealth, and, uh, and taking it back from the privatization. And uh, exactly that. So what would you say then, are the universal properties of a community of abundance? Well, at the level of economics, it's cooperation. There is enough. Co-producing something, living a walkable life, a local life, keeping the money circulating. At the level of the, of the culture, it's, it's reimagining silence. It's reimagining mystery. See, in the, in the, in the uh, science world, traditionally, it's, everything's knowable. We just haven't got there yet. In a, in a culture of, of outside the consumer world, a culture of neighborliness is what we're calling it in the last book. Uh, some things are just unknowable. Yeah. And so we need, and time is a construction. There's all the time in the world for everything. It's the one thing we've all got the same amount of. And so you reimagine time, mystery, relationships become central. You do things that are inconvenient. You do things that take a long time, that cost too much and can't be taken to scale. And so it changes your whole speaking and thinking about what, how we want to spend our days, how we, how we want to be together. Robert's rules of order will no longer be necessary in a neighborly world. And then part of this is also not only embracing mystery and uncertainty, but together this, bracing the, the fallibility of ourselves as well, yeah? Fallibility is huge. It's, thank you for adding that. I am imperfect. I'm wounded at the moment of birth. And my uh, woundedness, my fallibility, is what makes me human. It's not a problem to be solved. I'm getting old. There's no solution to that. And because of this, this system way of thinking is that um, because we're fallible, then we need experts to do things for us because, you know, we're not perfect. Exactly. I'm not broken. I'm just human. So if I'm human, it, it lifts the burden of having to fix myself. And most of us at our age have been working on ourselves for decades yeah. with almost no results. So... <laughs> You know, so it's exactly that. We don't, we don't, and that's why to call somebody poor is an insult. We pretend they're broken. They're not broken. They just don't have a lot of money. To what extent do you also think social phenomena such as divorce, for example, uh, are caused by the family losing its function due to these, again, these functions being farmed out to experts? Because we... Um... I, I think it's... I, you know, I think it's true. You know... I think the family has lost its function, and so has young people. Right now, a teenager 
this uh, somebody who's got nothing to do. And, and so we found, used schools as a custodial place for them. We need a place to house them. We warehouse the elderly. We warehouse the young. Now, schooling is important. It matters. But even the schools have become professionalized. And so now p parents are terribly anxious. Where, where does my kid go to college? How old is your kid? Two. You know, let the kid have a childhood. Don't don't put him to work. Uh, the family, youth, have lost their capacity to produce anything, and therefore uh, they've lost their centrality. And family in the broadest sense is not about, a, you know, people even living together, but you see all these movements trying to reestablish our relatedness to each other, co-housing, yeah. cooperative businesses. So definitely, now the world, because I can't make the living I used to make, I'm going to have to start figuring out how to produce something. I'm going to learn how to garden. I'm going to learn how to take care of small engines. I'm going to learn to walk dogs and to listen. So it's going to happen. Great. Well, what would you say are the other basic community and family functions? Well, amazing to raise children and to care for the earth and to be safe and to welcome in those on the margin, to take people who are vulnerable and stop being afraid of the immigrant and the stranger. So it's to welcome the stranger. Uh, and it, and it's, to, it's just to heal the woundedness of these, um, see, in your terms, these certainties. What we're fighting against yeah. is certainty in any form. Because I, you know, I write books and stuff, and so they've done well. Yeah. And so companies call me and say, oh, you wrote the book on empowerment. Let's talk about that. And, and as soon as the term becomes popular, you can't use it anymore. It becomes commercialized. And so, so you're constantly having to find new language and new ways to express our intimacy, our interconnected. And the fact that not, not knowing is a viable leadership position. I'm looking for the candidate when they're asked a question that says, that's a hell of a good question. I'll let you know as soon as something occurs to me. <laughs> and that, you're talking about that one of the aspects is um, looking after the our surroundings and, and the environment. Now, economics at the moment is built around this dogma of growth that we, in order for us to um, to live this comfortable life, we just have to carry on growing. But obviously, you know, we live on a finite planet. If you just do the math, we're going to run into serious problems. We've done the math. Okay. Everybody knows. Everybody knows that, as Leonard Cohen says, everybody knows the ship is broken. Uh, the shift is in our thinking. We have to imagine. Walter Brueggemann says that the Jews were slaves in Egypt for so long because they couldn't imagine not being slaves. We can't imagine not being consumers. Uh, and so more data isn't needed. But we're just going to have to have to stop thinking growth is a good thing. You know, we have this phrase from the business perspective, grow or die. I don't believe that. And, and, and I think death is underrated in addition. You know, death is not a problem to be solved. We spend about a third of our money on the last six months of life. I, I want to start a movement saying, I'll give you the six months. Okay. And then we, <laughs> the six months are yours. I don't want them. <laughs> okay. Well, that, that sort of, in a way, leads into my next question. So how does a competent community create satisfaction and cure our addiction to consumption? You don't fight consumption directly. You don't argue against. It's too powerful. You don't argue against the empire. Too powerful, really. Most revolutions just recreate what they fought. And so this whole aggressive male um, take to this. And so we have to live the alternative. So a competent community is a group of people in a neighborhood or a city who decide that they're going to do everything they can to encourage walking, to encourage bicycles, to encourage planet-friendly things. Uh, they're going to decide to, to uh, construct neighborhoods that uh, where people are connected again. Jane Jacobs kind of, you know, uh, the neighborliness. Uh, they, everything in scale is reduced. 
So we give small grants of $500 to people who are doing something together to make the neighborhood better. And we create spaces where people can gather. And when we gather, we don't give lectures. You know, right now we hold neighborhood summits and town meetings with one person standing up with a microphone and everybody sitting in lines like sardines as if all the wisdom, you know, you mentioned earlier that this is a, a, a uh, redefinition of expertise. I don't need a professional to raise my children, to keep my, you know, I want my kids to have good teachers. I need the police to, 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 to manage the edges. Uh, I need the health care. When I cut myself, somebody's got to sew me up. It's not an argument against expertise. It's an argument of the belief that expertise is the point, that without an expert, I know nothing. Yeah. And so every city can, can reimagine what it's good at, what its gifts are, and not view it in a competitive race to get Toyota to come to town. You know, to Toyota's not coming. More jobs are not coming. We don't have to give away taxes and start a corporate welfare program in order to encourage large companies because of jobs. Jobs no longer becomes the argument to do anything. Well, the argument against democracy is job creation. Um, okay. What are the um, three basic properties then of a competent community? Uh, neighborliness, neighborliness, and neighborliness. <laughs> You know, it's the pro it's people know the names of my children. I'll just stop there. And you show me a neighborhood or a community, and most of this is about neighborhoods. It's not about whole cities. You know, you can only handle maybe a group of four or five thousand people. That's big enough. And so it's about people. It's about social capital. You people basically uh, see the future, the capacity to produce something with each other. And are, do people have a habit of activism, of doing something? It's one thing to care about something. It's another thing to take responsibility for it. So to me, a competent neighborhood is one that focuses on gifts, that realizes it has enough, and is willing to, willing to produce together the future that they want. And then, then you can say, what systems do we need to support us? And by gifts, you mean? The gifts of cooking, the gifts of listening, the gifts of fishing, the gifts of sewing, the gifts of gardening, the gifts of paying attention, uh, the gifts of, of, of touch. And you, know, you, ask, you ask people these questions. This is where John McKnight has been so wonderful. And you say, well, what are you good at? And what are you willing to teach others? And, and that becomes the economic, that becomes the circle of economics of the commons. And then once in a while, we, you, we might have a card. You know, you talk about Denmark. They, they're just smarter than we are. I mean, we were there and we talked to somebody and they say, oh, we can't afford a car. And you say, yeah, there's four of us own a car. We don't each need a car. And so they need, a, they ride their bicycles. And we said, in the winter? And they say, yeah, it's really cold, period. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you brought up Denmark, because this idea that welcome of strangers is critical, and I absolutely agree. Now, Denmark is a uh, society, it has a strong sense of community, has very high statistics of, of well-being, but it also has very low levels of immigration, well, until recently. I know. The crisis. Now, it's a bit of a club, you know. Um, and, and I've also experienced that to an extent. I lived for many years in Spain, and I love Spain. And they they are very socially skilled, the Spanish, and they have a really great sense of community. But it's hard to get in there unless you get married to a lo you know a local or whatever. Yeah, I know. So so how do you get around that? Well, there's a dark side to everything. There's a shadow side to everything. Young was right. Yeah. All right. So you can't just view the light. You have to view the winter and the fall, not just the summer. And so, of course, there's a shadow side to community. And, and, and most of these places like Seattle and Portland and Vancouver in the, in, the, in the Western Hemisphere tend to be homogeneous. And they are going to go through a real crisis and decide whether they have the depth of compassion to enable us to welcome the stranger in. And, and we've produced these strangers. Our violence is producing the migrations. Our violence is sustained by our economic system. 
you know, I, I read a, a book called The Empire of Cotton, which really launched the industrialization. And they said that it, 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 industrialization never would have occurred without a strong military behind it, the strong violence and force. It never would have occurred without free labor, American slavery. And so all these are a fabric between the Denmark and I have to deal with immigration. Where does the immigration come from? Well, it comes from a consumer society where militarism and violence and uh, all of that are help produce it. So we're trying to create an alternative to that. Can we have an economy, a way of being together? It's not based on, on uh, competition, ownership, growth, dominance. Yeah. So how do we go about that in practical terms? How do we go about <laughs> creating abundance without all those things? Well, the abundance is there. Yeah. Okay, so we don't have to create it. By doing what you're doing. See, uh, shifting, it takes art and narrative are the ultimate political weapons. Now, I can work on myself. Part of the dark side of healing, dark side of spirituality, is it's very individualistic. It's I. I'm working. Everybody says, I've got to work on myself first. Gandhi, you know, be the change you want to be in the world. Well, it's not enough. It's not enough. And, uh, and most people, once they gain consciousness, they, they leave the systems and go. So we need to value uh, the power of narrative, the power of speaking, of language, and create a language of connectedness, community, neighborliness, and realize that's what's worth talking about. And stop talking about the individual. Stop talking about individual rights, you know, stop. You know, and, 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 uh, so me, I go after the narrative first. Now, what to do with my day? That's quite simple. Walk. Don't waste so much damn food. Uh, this ur urban farming is everywhere. I went to my cooperative uh, drop zone and picked up my vegetables last night. They're the ugliest damn things I've ever seen. I mean, how can a carrot, I should have brought one, I could get one from my kitchen, but how can a carrot have self-esteem when it's all curled and gnarly? So eat that carrot and eat all, eat the food that's grown locally. Don't spend a penny outside, outside 10 miles of where you live. I mean, it's so simple. You know, and stop flushing the toilet at night, for God's sake. I mean, we have all the methodologies. We just, you're, we're working on saying, well, let's speak of that as our life rather than complain. Stop whining. Stop complaining about the 1%. And do you think through that process, then that will build up enough momentum to actually change the economic system? It has. It, it, it's underway. The future's here. And that's why when you say, could we talk? I say yes, because this is a political act, what we're doing, Barry. We're giving voice, we're treating, we're changing the world in terms of what constitutes news. And I support the alternative journalism groups that are popping up around the world also. So it's all these little things. You say, well, how do you take this to scale? And easy, you just add up a million little things that are happening. You don't take one thing and make it larger. And so uh, now how, how soon will this happen? I, I don't know. I'll never see it, but that's no big deal. Okay, well, just to round up, um, Peter, could you tell us something about the abundant community that you're already creating, that you have the website, etc., and how could people get involved? Well, everybody's going to get involved lo finding locally. Wherever you are, somebody has started a co-op. Somebody has started a conversation about co-housing. Uh, I have a website called Restore-Commons. Dot com. And so every time I hear somebody like you or find somebody that's saying something, I park it there. So it's a warehouse of ideas. And it gives voice to all the alternatives in journalism, in art, in space, in economics, in law, in all of these disciplines. There is a counter movement that's discovering an alternative way of being. So it's right around us. In Vancouver, go to the Abundant Community Initiative. There, the city of, Van of of Edmonton, rather, has created little neighborhood in neighborhoods 
neighborhood coordinators and connectors that are bringing people up and down the street together and saying, what are you good at? And how do we want to take advantage of that? So the, the world that you want to inhabit is around us. Our job is to make it visible and to show up for it. And you can't go anywhere where that world it doesn't exist. It's just it's not news. It's below the fold. It's in the center section of the newspaper. It's considered human interest, which means it has no power. Instead, every place I go, they're proud of their of their murder rate. They're proud. You know, everybody, everybody, any news station will tell you how many poor people there are, how many immigrants there are. Pick up the most liberal newspaper in the world, or whatever, if there's one left, which there isn't. And they still want to talk about who died yesterday. But I don't want, I don't want to be in that conversation. If, if my family died or a friend died, I want to know about that. But if anybody else died, I don't need to know about that. I don't consider that news. So I don't watch the evening news. If we stop watching and stop participating in the dire conversations, the conversations are fear. Uh, now, people accuse you of being unrealistic. There's nothing real about television. Reality shows are scripted. Don't you get that? There's no such thing a reality show. And so this becomes the work. It's the shift. It's the narrative shift in, a, in how you spend your days. And, uh, it's right there, and it doesn't cost much. That's the problem. Yeah. Just what, one other thought from psychology that ties in from with what you've what you've been saying the whole talk actually is that um, they've done studies with people where they uh, give them opportunity to either receive $20 or actually give $20 and people they, they get a lot more satisfaction as I'm sure you, as you'll know is that by giving than receiving we like to give we like to share that's right we also like even more see if I was doing the research or maybe you and I should do this it would not be do I want to give you $20 or get $20 it would be do I want to get $20 do I want to give $20 or do we want to produce something together Nobody researches co-production. Nobody researches that, you know, in the same way. And so even the giving and getting of $20 is in the context of economics. Yeah. But we laud great scientists. Again, science is an example. Nearly every scientific discovery has been a joint effort. It's, it's been teamwork. Every time you give an individual a Nobel Prize, you're telling a lie. Yeah. Anyway, we could go on all day here, Peter, but I think... Uh, uh, you got the point. We, we've got the point. Haven't we? <laughs> we've got, anyway, it's been fantastic talking to you, and, and, and I'm sure what you said will be of, of great interest to, to our listeners. So thank you very much for giving up your time today. It's been, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you for paying attention and caring about these things, Barry. We'll, we'll stay in touch, okay? You can find out more about Middleway Philosophy at www.middlewaysociety.org.